Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by my friend, Mr. Daniel Glass. Daniel, welcome back on the podcast. Thank you. It's always a pleasure, man. It's always a pleasure to talk about drum history. As you know, I'm a fan. (laughs) <laughs> you are a fan. You're, I mean, you are a uh, staple in the community of, of really an advocate for drum history and knowledge and learning. And uh, you kind of make it, I think you make it cool and approachable um, with your, your Vic Firth series that you've done um, and, and just all this great stuff. You've, there's no shortage of Daniel Glass content out there, which we'll, we'll definitely talk about today. Um, so, but that being said, Sometimes you got to pick a topic, and our topic for today is really the roots of the British invasion. And let's just say right off the bat that we're kind of going at this in a way that isn't Ringo centric and Charlie Watts centric and Definitely. Bonham. And I think these these drummers have and the movement that they were a part of re- have received a lot of attention and a lot of focus, um, and they all emerged. You know, in the early 60s, uh, I mean, the, the British invasion officially started, we might say, with the Beatles coming to America in 1964, and that, you know, then the Stones and the Who and the Yardbirds and, um, you know, all those bands followed. Uh, so we know a certain degree of that, and, and in the drumming community, we studied those drummers to a, a fairly deep uh, level. But what most people don't realize is that there was a a history of British rock that goes back to the mid 50s, which is the beginning of rock in the US as well. And although rock, certainly rock, we could say rock and roll was born in the United States, um, the the way it impacted the UK and the the scene that evolved and what happened is very, it's a very interesting story in its own right. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So if you think we're going to just be talking about Ringo and Charlie Watts, uh-uh. Yeah. They're the, we're talking about their forebearers. Now, yeah. they were only forebearers by 10 years, <laughs> but in, you know, in contemporary music, that's a whole generation. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Oh, my God. I mean, you think about the, the differences in music from like 1980s music to like 1990s grunge, and it's just different. It's just a different world. You've sent me over like a nice little outline here, and I also want to say that I have um, downloaded the Roots of Rock Drumming book um, from Hudson Music, which um, you're a contributor to. With uh, and, and there's a lot there's a lot of great stuff in there. I mean, I know you worked with some people, different people on that. Right off the bat, do you want to talk about that book a little bit, just so yeah. we know about that? Well, that's you know that's actually where I first got hip to a lot of this stuff. So um, the the book was originally a, a project between Steve Smith and Rob Wallace. Uh, essentially at Hudson Music. And they were going to make a documentary. Um, Back in the day, Hudson, in an earlier iteration, had produced um, a great video series called Legends of Jazz Drumming. And they'd come up with these amazing clips um, that of drum solos. And at the time, when they did this, there was no internet. Uh, Nobody had ever seen these. A guy named Bruce Clauber had been collecting... um, collecting these for many years and when they came out i think it was a three vid- literally vhs videos hmm. it to me it was a revelation and i snatched them up and i loved it and when i got involved with my band royal crown review who we played a lot of this classic stuff it was great for me to to inform what i was doing with that band anyway flash forward they decided hudson did they wanted to do a um like legends of rock drumming video series or dvd set um and what they quickly realized is that licensing video was going to be too expensive it just wasn't going to be financially viable and so but what they had done in the meantime was they had interviewed a lot of the pioneers of rock um going back to you know the guys that say played with elvis presley or uh Sandy Nelson or uh, the guy that played with, you know, Jerry Allison who played with Buddy Holly. Anyway, they'd done a lot of interviews and they were, they were, some of them were on video, but they, then the project just sat on a shelf for years. Flash forward even more to 2010 when I moved to New York. Now, by this time, I was friends with Steve and, uh, and Robin Paul uh, from Hudson, Steve Smith. Um, and now that I was local, they came to me and said, hey, we've got all these interviews. We don't know what to do with them. We think we want to do a book. So they they said, we transcribe the interviews, or we will. Can you edit them down? And I became the editor on the project. And I contributed a couple of my own interviews that I had done 
with uh, Louis Prima's drummer, Bobby Morris, and um, the drummer for Bill Haley and the Comets. So just to add to that. So we sure. came out with this great book that kind of goes from the early 50s and the, it, it goes chronologically and covers a lot of great drummers and all the early parts of rock and roll. So embedded in this, they had actually interviewed three of the legends of British rock drumming. Brian Bennett, who's a drummer with a band called The Shadows. Uh, Clem Catini, who was a, a, a major studio musician. And Bobby Graham. Uh, who also, th- these were sort of the Hal Blaine's, you might say, sure. of of British rock recording. Yeah. And uh, th- when I edited those interviews, I was amazed at what was happening at this time and how much was going on and how it had been affected by the American stuff. So it tells a really fascinating story how skiffle plays in, mm-hmm. um, which is something that you sort of, you're like, really? There's a musical style called skiffle? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I mean, that's what I always thought. Like, yeah. I, I learned about Skiffle from Spinal Tap. You know, yeah. David St. Hubbins says, I was in a Skiffle group called The Strangers. <laughs> and I was like, Skiffle. It's not the coolest name. It's, it's not, not like the coolest name. Thrash music. And yet, <laughs> it's, it's a very, it plays a very important role. Without like Skiffle, there'd be no Jeff Beck. There'd be no Jimmy Page. Yeah. There would be, you know, I mean, it's, uh, it's kind of a, a big deal. So, yeah. anyway, um, that's, that's where this all comes from. And that got me sort of interested in the early British invasion and the session scene going on over there. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Yeah. Well, probably there are those in England that are deeper in, into this than I would be, being that they're there. But um, it's, I think, for a chat here, it's, sure. a, it's a good story. Without further ado here, let's kind of just jump in and start at the beginning of what we would call that the the, the roots of the British invasion. Because um, again, British invasion is sort of a buzzword where you immediately go to like a very specific time, a very specific place. But obviously, it didn't just happen overnight. Nothing ever really does. Um, so wh- why don't you just take it away and kind of tell us how it all started? Well, it really goes back to World War II. In World War II, a variety of things happened. Uh the Germans were bombing the hell out of the British. That's Mm -hmm. number one. Yeah. Because they didn't have long range missiles yet. Thankfully they were trying to develop them during the war, but the, the, they, so instead of shooting missiles, they had to send planes and the bombing of Britain. Uh, and this was happening in the early years of the war before the United States entered. What they were trying to do was bring England to its knees without having to try to get across the English channel and actually invade. So this is, you know, one of the things that, in a, obviously Pearl Harbor was the spark that brought the United States into the war, um, but that was the Japanese. But at this point, you know, Churchill and the British were saying, hey, if you guys don't come over here, eventually they're going to be able to, they had already taken over France and Belgium and the, the whole European continent. So, you know, the UK, England was the sort of the last holdout in, in some ways. Sure. So, when America did eventually enter the war, they not only brought the military with them, but they brought American culture. And of course, what was popular at that time was swing music, big band music. Uh, One of the things that uh, was something that kept spirits up during the war, remember, uh, the United States, no bombs fell on us, but in, in London place was bombed to rubble and yeah. so the the kids of the british invasion the ones that would grow up to be the jimmy pages and the john bonhams and the pete townsends they all were born either during or right after the war it was a terrible terrible time it was a grim time um some of the kids from london had been taken out and spent the war years on farms things like that because you could be bombed you know yeah. a lot of people were killed in these bombings or they yeah. lived in in the underground uh you know the the tube they lived in tube stations sort of what's kind of happening in the ukraine right sure. now you know people are displaced and people are living underground and all kinds of of terrible things so it was a very very gray period and a lot of those youth of the british invasion grew up in a in a gray time and what brought them a lot of joy and hope was American music and American culture. Yeah. And jazz has always represented something that is about freedom and self-expression. I think it's one of the things about the African-American 
contribution to jazz, which is kind of like be funky and don't be so uptight, you know, is a is what makes American music to this day so appealing to other cultures where people are much more uptight. Certainly you might say Britain, mm -hmm. Germany, these places are more buttoned up. The religious, you know, yeah. heritage is like, don't just be like, blah, wow, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. let it all hang Monarchies out. Monarchies and things like that. Yeah. Right. But jazz is about like, be free to be your bad, funky self. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it, it just in a, in, in, in common, more vernacular kind of term. Sure. So this had a lot of appeal. Big band, swing, jazz had, it was danceable. It was um, upbeat, positive. Gave this shining image of America as a place that was not only there to bring military, but also to like hearts and minds, win over hearts and minds, right? Yeah. So there was a thing called the Voice of America. I don't know all the details about it, but it was part of when the Americans came and set up shop in the UK and they played contemporary music. Uh, and once the war ended, they played not only swing, jazz, and big band, but they started to play bebop. And they started to play rhythm of blues. And then by the mid 50s, they were playing rock and roll. Uh, so all of this um, was the undercurrent to what this new generation of youth was getting exposed to. And it was a real good antidote uh, for, you know, the, the lives they were living, which was recovering from the war. Nobody yeah. had any money. Nobody could afford anything. So what kind of music did they make? Well, most instruments were either unavailable or out of the question expensive. Um, and so what developed was a culture of what we call skiffle music. Skiffle music was sort of a combination of American folk and blues, all of which were having resurgences in the United States or were popular styles in the United States at this time. And they were simple styles that anybody could get involved with. So when you look at pictures of skiffle bands, it was a guitar culture. You mm -hmm. could get a cheap child size guitar or a, you know, cheap, cheap guitar. Yeah. Um, didn't cost you a lot of money to, to get in, to gain entry into, into playing music. And you could drag a guitar around with you. Also instruments like the washboard were a part of skiffle, skiffle, uh, wash tub bass. Yes. I have all these pictures of skiffle bands, teenagers, and the 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 base was like it was like a wash tub. Imagine a wash tub with a broomstick and one string, and you pulled on the broomstick to change the tension on the string while you plucked the string. Now maybe you could get three notes out of that, you know, yeah. but but you could play a simple blues or a folk song. Yeah, you're playing something. I mean, and it's and you know, again, I think a famous example of it, and we said we're not gonna really talk about them too much, but the Beatles and the Quarry Men really kind of had that that early I mean, they used the the washboard, you know, and, exactly. and, and the, it's just I mean, everything you're saying is so it's it's these kids who are so like they're growing up in this downtrodden, just miserable like environment. And it's like this is their way to let loose and kind of grease their hair back and uh yeah and skiffle it's just a lot of like i think of the dancing too of a lot of jumping from videos you see and moving around and just kind of like it's a way to express yourselves and obviously it's a way to um kind of revolt against your parents a little bit because exactly it was they're, their they're, own music of their own generation yes, absolutely and dad uh, might not like it so they're gonna love it and that's that's rock and roll right there you know yeah so you know there's a famous photo of Jimmy Page when he's nine or ten years old. Uh, not a photo, a video. You can actually look this up. Um, and he is, they're talking about Skiffle, and he plays like a little blues kind of a song uh, with a, with another buddy, two guitar players. Uh, maybe the most famous Skiffle artist was a guy named Lonnie Donegan, who did a song called The Rock Island Line, which is uh, it's a, blue, a black blues classic about yep. a train. Uh, going down to New Orleans, and there's a great video of him performing it on British television. So, you know, you had this happening, and you had a vibrant, as well, jazz scene, swing, big band scene. Big band was very popular in the UK. So, and of course, bebop. So, all these exported styles were popular. And when you think of somebody like John Bonham, and I, on my podcast, which we might talk about in a bit, or it's yep. on hiatus now, but all my episodes are available on my on my website and they link over to Drummer's Resource yep. where they live. But 
Um, I do a two-parter on John Bonham, and the whole first episode is about John Bonham's influences. And people might think, um, you know, like the, maybe the most famous example of John Bonham's influence of, of what he listened to was the uh, intro to rock and roll, right? And people mm-hmm. maybe, now it's maybe common knowledge enough that the intro he plays is note for note lifted from a Little Richard song from 1956 yeah. called Keep It Knockin'. Um, the drummer, by the way, uh, who played on that, Charles Connor, not Earl Palmer, who played on most of Little Richard's stuff, but Charles Connor was Little Richard's touring drummer. And I interviewed him and got to know him. He cool. lived in L.A. He's now departed, sadly. But, okay, Led Zeppelin, the song Rock and Roll, same intro. But people don't realize if you watch early John Bonham drum solos, he's playing the drum also waltzes, which was a Max Roach drum solo in three, where he does the, yeah. you know, the thing with his feet. Boom, ch- boom, ch- one, yep. two, three, one, jigga, jigga, jump, jigga. And Bonham lifted that, yep. you know, note for note. And uh, Bonham was a huge Krupa fan. And uh, a lot of that stuff was there. So these are all things that, you know, and then later on, Bonham was influenced by reggae and he was influenced by the Purdy Shuffle, you know, and um, he displayed his influences right in what he was doing with Led Zeppelin. Sure. So, um, you know, th- this influence uh, was big and it spread uh, uh, to, to to this new generation. Yeah. Uh, now, you also had an emerging rock scene in the mid, so this is again ten years before, um, the rock and roll obviously took off. Uh, technology is getting better at 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 mass media, getting mass media out there, so people are able to see Elvis. Um, unfortunately, Elvis never left the U.S. He never toured abroad, which is, hmm. most people I, you don't think about it, but he never did that, any, no. any interna- international touring. Wow, and. Yeah, he went to Germany when he was in the army, and that was it. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I mean, he was stationed in Germany and uh, met Priscilla there, I think. I yes, believe he did. She was like she was 14. She was like 14, yeah. But they, you know, they they were, they didn't date at that no, point. No. But they knew each other, and uh, that's where they, they first met. One of the cool things about rock is that it was, it was very well featured in movies. And as television would become more popular... Um, you know, played a played a big role in that. So the dissemination of rock was it, it continued to to be bigger and bigger and bigger as the ability to reach, um, you know, as as mass media became mass media. Well, um, and actually, there is a good. I, I'm kind of thinking of the the question of like, all right, so um, the the uh, how the children of the generation then young adults, let's say, are receiving this where. Is it would it be radio broadcasts? Would it be records? Would it be TV and film? Or is it all of the above? I mean, I, I don't really know. I know that f- TV wasn't that common until the mid fifties in the United States, and I kind of imagine it was maybe a little bit later in the UK because sure. of because of World War Two and yeah. you know what we're talking about. I don't. I can't speak to TV, but certainly the movies uh, were. They got movies over there. They saw a lot of their heroes. Um, what what's interesting about and certainly they got records um mm-hmm. and another way that they got hip to this stuff was uh was was concerts so some of the early rock acts uh did tour uh bill haley interestingly even though today we might look at bill haley and go well he's kind of square and he seemed kind of old for rock you know elvis was like 19 when he hit most of those rockers were in their late teens or early 20s the the earliest generation of yeah. first big rock stars um bill haley was significantly older than that and he looked kind of like your uncle not yeah. like a rock star he wasn't a good looking guy but he's one of the people that toured in the uk and in germany and places like that and for a lot of those audiences he represented rock because that was the only rock concert they could go see yeah. You know, so, so, but Buddy Holly toured a bit over there. Um, and if, if you look at, uh, Paul McCartney was influenced by Buddy Holly when he toured because what was Buddy Holly's band called the crickets mm-hmm. and the Beatles literally were named as sort yeah. of, a um, 
you know, uh, in 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 honor of that, or yeah. or that they loved Buddy Holly's name, and they wanted to name themselves of that. There's actually a wonderful movie, uh, which is called The Real Buddy Holly Story. You can find it on YouTube. Uh, it was a movie made by Paul McCartney. He was so mad when the Buddy Holly story with Gary Busey came out at how that story told Buddy Holly's life in terms of a love story and kind of ignored the music and didn't mm. really get into the musical sure. aspect of it, which most musical biopics do. Yeah, they just yeah. talk about, they, you know, <laughs> they treat the music part very superficially. But yeah. um, in this, in this, so he made, Paul McCartney made a documentary called The Real Buddy Holly Story. And he goes to Clovis, New Mexico, where Buddy Holly made and, and the Crickets made their first records uh, and interviews Jerry Allison and the remaining members of the Crickets that are still alive and shows all these different elements about what Buddy Holly was doing that were so important to him. One of which was that Buddy Holly strummed his guitar all with down strums. So mm. he was going jing, 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 back and forth. It was jung, jung, yeah. jung, 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 jung. How does rock and roll often played you know i'm not a guitar expert but dun, yeah. dun, dun, like a lot of downstrokes so these were things that were had buddy holly not come to the uk they may not have known that so the young people had a chance to see you know some of these american artists coming over yeah and it's interesting because colin hanton who was the drummer in the quarry man was on the podcast and he talked about oh, how, cool. how how paul would would um they love he they everyone liked Paul in the band because he knew the lyrics to songs because it was now we take it for granted that you can look it up on lyrics.com or something. Yeah. No, you hear this song once and then you gotta wait till it comes on, on the rotation oh, again. I used so, to have fights with my sister when we were kids and we would place bets about what the lyrics were. And you know <laughs> I'm still wrong a lot, even with yeah. the internet. I'm like, oh, I thought it was something completely different. Yeah. But just that ability and that uh just the different the 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 world of you got to go see it live you only hear it once there's no social media there's no right. streaming so you, you have, have to hear it one once. chance to yeah. see buddy holly live and yeah. that imprints you big time yeah. now maybe he would be on tv but again you can just dial up whenever you wanted to if you were lucky to catch that tv appearance yeah. now uh, so talking about live performances though there's two other things that were happening in the late 50s and early 60s that were influential on the british scene um Gene Vincent and Eddie Cochran, who were two of the biggest stars of the first wave of rock of rock stars at sure. that time, you had Little Richard, Chuck Berry, and Bo Diddley. Um, the, they were the this this generation was the early rock that was really dangerous, that was terrifying. It was multiracial. It was it was raunchy. It was rebellious. You know, and so uh, these early heroes. Um, as I said, not that many of them traveled internationally, but Bill Haley did, uh, Buddy Holly did, and Eddie Cochran and uh, Gene Vincent. Gene Vincent, yep. Uh, Eddie Cochran, great guitar player, very influential on Brian Setzer, for example, mm -hmm. who who I worked with for a long time. Um, and Gene Vincent, Bebop Alula, She's My Baby. And Eddie Cochran wrote Summertime Blues and yep. um, some of these other famous songs. Anyway, they toured England together, and Brian Bennett who's one of the drummers I mentioned earlier, they picked up a British band. So he actually had the chance to tour with them. Hmm. And um, unfortunately, they were in a terrible car accident. I think it was on that tour. Hmm. And Eddie Cochran was killed and Gene Vincent was maimed. Oh my and God. Uh, had to leave the business for a few years while he was recuperating. This was sort of the, the whole story of early rock and roll is kind of tragic because... It was this amazing thing that popped up, you know, mid-50s, 54, 55. And by the end of the 50s, all of those early rockers had either had legal trouble, uh, were blacklisted because of that, had died, a bunch of them died, Buddy Holly, Big Bopper, of course, those guys, yeah. Eddie Cochran died, were in terrible car accidents, Gene Vincent, um, uh, 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 Carl Perkins, uh, yeah. Yeah. Elvis, Elvis went in the army, Gene, uh, Little Richard quit. Music and joined the ministry, and he was out of it for a while. Chuck Berry was arrested. He's, he was generally a, a pretty bad dude, bad yeah. character. Jerry Lee Lewis, you know, was nailed for marrying his cousin and was blackballed. And then there was this huge, um, like, uh, blowback 
from upstanding American society who were mad that that blacks were involved. Of course, mm-hmm. there was the end, you know, devil music, N word yep. music. Yep. Uh, Elvis terrified them. He was so had so much sexual energy. He was a good looking guy. They were afraid their daughters were going to, you know, drop their panties for all these <laughs> rock dudes. I mean, it's yeah. the same thing that happens every time a new style of music becomes popular is that, yeah. you know, like what we would call civilized society or whatever, they freak out. But in this case, it, this combination of bad things happening and blowback really killed that that movement. And it was between, yeah. say, 59 and 64 when the British came back and really brought rock back in a new way that, yeah. you know, that um, rock then really took off. But there was sort of four or five years where it was it, like you, you had like fake rockers like Fabian and Bobby Rydell and, you know, people that were that were acceptable to the industry. That's when you had beach blanket bingo movies and Jerry Lewis movies and Doris yeah. Day movies. And it, they tried to whitewash and clean it all up. You know, well, that's the end of a lot of things is when it becomes commercial. Like think of like disco. And I heard some movie or show was saying when Disney released a uh, disco album, disco was probably dead, <laughs> you know, and, and but it's it's interesting how you said all of those guys uh, had horrible ends to their careers and lives. But like that almost was the like the like tide washing out the 50s rock and roll and then the 60s next generation exactly like you're saying with the, the british guys it, it gave way for that next sound because they really don't have it sounds different i mean it, that, that goes without saying but we think of like with like gene vincent and stuff it's like it is and 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 eddie cocker it's like v- rockabilly it has a very rockabilly feel like slap back kind of delays and stuff but then when you fast forward into the 60s into what we're considering really i think what most people consider the the rock and roll like the british invasion which is really what you hear on the radio now of rock and roll, like classic rock. It doesn't sound the same as that that kind of like 50s rock. It's interesting, though, yeah. because the Beatles and the Stones, their first bunches of albums sound like cover albums. You're, I mean, you're right. The majority of the material of cover are covers and they yeah. are sounding like that 50s stuff. So, yeah, you know, the, the part of the Beatles that that, you know, once they started writing original music more, that's what we what we key in on. And they certainly yeah. took all of that and did their own thing with it and were so responsible for changing, you know, what rock would become. But yeah. to go back to the 50s, you know, we're we're sure, talking I guess course. we're talking we're still talking about influences, things that influenced yes. the British. So let's talk about the British and what they did with that. Uh, with that. So there were several a variety of scenes that developed. There was skiffle, which um was this sort of acoustic folk kind of a style yep. and certainly the blues played a huge uh part in that um the the uh i i should men- mention one more very very important influence that showed up was american blues musicians like the guys from chicago and gals chess records and um willie dixon who's was involved with chess he was sort of the liaison maybe between the artists and the business men because he he had some skills with arranging, he was a good producer, he knew how to wrangle musicians, but he also knew how to do business, you know, the way that the Chess Brothers were doing it. So he was kind of, in that Chicago blues world, he played a very unique role. He certainly wrote amazing songs, um, and uh, he, he was a great bass player, but he also kind of was really good at, at putting stuff together. And what was happening is that right when that early rock and roll stuff was dying out, the electric Chicago blues stuff was also dying out. It had been around for a decade. What was replacing it was Motown and Stax, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Which had started in the early 60s and they were starting to ascend. And it was also their version of black rhythm and blues or blues was moving away from more of the um, like the the rural field blues thinking of like sure. you know john lee hooker or muddy waters where yeah. you still get the sense of the delta and the south and what they really wanted to do was is that that style of blues was was sold primarily to black audiences and what they were trying to do was make that style of blues or r&b into something that could be sold on a on a widespread scale and so motown 
took that and, and moved it forward, obviously they wanted to cross over and and sell the blues to white audiences. And so yeah. songwriting took off and, you know, Stax was a little more rootsy because they were down in the South. But definitely both of those labels really pushed things forward along with p- p- artists like Ray Charles and stuff. But yeah, the, yeah. the traditional blues guys were trying to figure out what to do. And they found an audience in the uk not only the uk but germany france the netherlands Mm -hmm. and willie dixon put together these tours that were called the american folk blues festival folk and blues festival and i didn't really know that much about these until i got there's a three back again in the day back in the 90s when i was collecting everything i get my hands on there's a three volume dvd and it's incredible not only did they do concert tours and what willie dixon did was he put together there was a european promoter who paid for all this willie dixon put together like an all-star group these tours would be not just muddy waters or howlin wolf it would be muddy waters and howlin wolf Mm -hmm. and john lee hooker and uh you know, uh, just a, a panoply. And they would bring the chess house guys. So Fred Bilo and guys like that, you know, drummer Fred Bilo was sort of the, the guy for that blues scene. He was the, the sure. best known name studio guy. He played with Chuck Berry, but he also played with Little Walter and he played with, yeah. um, you know, uh, all these different artists. So these amazing tours would come over and not only did they do tours, but they did concert TV specials. And that's what's on this DVD set. If you just Google this or put it into YouTube, it's amazing because they built these sets as if you're on the stoop of a house in the South, in the Delta. And the musicians would be hanging out and they had a couple of extras. And then they would have a scene like in a, in a roadhouse, you know, uh, where people would be dancing and it with extras, you know, and it was just like, they're That's cool. It's the, t- it's America. It's like this. Oh, this is what America is. They beauti- <laughs> it's so well done. It's so classy. The audio is incredible. And you get to see these artists like represented at their absolute best. And a lot of these artists were at their peak and yeah. were, were very popular. So when you think about, you know, American roots blues, basically very like roots oriented blues, that also made a huge impression on Europe. And yeah. I think it's interesting because, you know, going back to um, earlier styles of black music, uh, ragtime, early jazz, uh, of course, you know, bebop, these very sort of specifically black styles had an enormous appeal, just like hip hop does today or funk sure. does um, outside of the U.S. And again, yeah. I don't, you know, I, I think there are le- fewer sort of racial hang ups because for people who didn't grow up with all this baggage that we grew up with, with constant kind of yeah. racial tension and issues and back and forth. And we don't need to get into all that, but yeah, obviously yeah, that yeah. continues to go on and on and on sadly. Yeah. But um, a lot of African-American artists have felt more comfortable in Europe. A lot of them became expats and lived in Europe. Sure. A lot of the beboppers, a lot of the early jazz musicians. Um, and yeah. when I, spent a lot of time in Europe, I'd meet black musicians who had just bailed on America. They were living over there and doing their thing and getting more respect and dealing with less crap, you know, yeah. et cetera. So anyway, th- these tours came and they came every year starting in 62. I think they actually went beyond 64, but those three years, you can imagine if you're, oh, yeah. you know, Brian Jones and whatever, I want to read this because it says on Wikipedia, actually, yeah. as I have up. So the American Folk Blues Festival, it says uh, uh, 62 for the first event, like first time it happened. It said attendees, known attendees. I'm sure someone else might have been there, but it said Mick Jagger, Keith Richards, Brian Jones and Jimmy Page were at the first one. Uh, subsequent attendees at the first London Festival that they found out, I guess, about where Eric Burden, Eric Clapton, Steve Winwood. Yeah. Uh, and there, there have to be more. I the mean, list goes the- on and on. That's the yearbook of like uh, <laughs> of British invasion of British invasion. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So these 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 were concert tours and they were TV specials. And you should you know to whoever's listening, just punch that in and go check it out. They're spectacular, yeah. and you'll get a whole new appreciation for that style of blues because it's kind of presented in a very sort of the way it's presented is is delicious. Um, well, and, and I just want to also throw out too the the logistics. I guess it makes more sense to take kind of a a stable of stars you know to talk about i think to use the term from that thing you do um 
at, take them all at once over to perform because why not? In, as opposed to using one seat on an airplane. Yeah, I mean that happened in the United States too. Early rock yeah. was characterized by package tours. Yeah, a stable of stars from the different labels, or yep. you know, or Alan Freed, the DJ, would present you know a a night of these and such yeah. stars, and so that was you know everybody ran out, and did their hit or two. And you just trotted out many different people. So through that, you could sell out larger venues. Uh, you could, you know, ec- more economically move people around and house yeah. people. And and I mean, it's a predecessor to a modern festival, to Coachella or whatever. I mean, well, it really is. But you, there but would usually all- just be one house band that would back those oh. artists. It wasn't like each artist had their own band per se. So, for example, with with these American folk blues tours, you would have. Uh, you would have a house, you know, the house band of chess session guys would go, sure. and they would just back up all the artists for that particular show or that particular tour. And that was the same with the rock stuff: is that often it would just be the singer, and then or the you know whatever the headliner, and then there would be a house band that would that would back people up. So, and that cool. kind of thing cool. has gone on. You know, it happened in the swing era. Once the swing era came to an end, a lot of the big band stars would go out. Uh, same, same sort of thing. So anyway, sure, sure. um, but one other thing I want to bring up here is we talked about records and this is another very interesting factoid that really makes sense when you think about it. So when you, when you think of the Beatles, they were from Liverpool. Now Liverpool was halfway up England. It was an industrial city. It was not a cool cosmopolitan town like London. I mean, compared comparatively, sure. Yet, the, the, the Beatles and other bands that were so prominent in the scene came from there. So why is that? Well, Liverpool was a coastal town, and it was on the, uh, the west coast of the, the island. And so when ships came bearing records, they would stop in Liverpool, which was on the mm. mouth of the Mercy River. And then everything would go down the Mercy River to get to London and and point south. So mm. we you hear about the Mercy Beat that was kind of the the cool 1960s sound that was very progressive because the musicians in Liverpool had access to these great records. Either they had access to more records or they, you know, they had access to them first. And yeah. so they were very musically savvy, which is why Liverpool, you know, sort of became this hub. Interesting. You might yeah. say. Yeah. And then there was a label called Pie, P-Y-E, that reissued a lot of chess titles there. Mm. So it would obviously be very difficult to get American records, you know, like if you're a super fan of the blues. So Pie Records would, you know, they signed British artists, but they also reissued American releases to make them available on a widespread scale in in the uk it sounds like to check in on timeline here like the 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 americans have come over which which even if you back up further americans were influenced by all kinds of other you know music from africa when when it was at its base here you know you got the new orleans sound then that's been exported going over to europe so it's kind of uh it's it's going then that way then the 50s all happens rock and roll is really kind of spreading around the world then that sort of is dying down and these british you know the youth of 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 the uk are absorbing it they're going in person they're they're getting records off off the ship and uh it's it's influencing them so that's kind of where we're at and right and they're now, poor right? and they can't afford more than a guitar <laughs> and yes, and i right. think root styles for young people you know Something that's as polished as, say, a jazz big band, again, that's something for their parents. Something that is really stripped down where you sitting there with your little guitar and you're trying to figure out a Muddy Waters lick or, you know, whatever, uh, that, had, that had a huge appeal as well. Now, yeah. one thing we still have to discuss is what was the, the British version of rock and roll. So, you talked about Brian Bennett, who played mm-hmm. with Eddie Cochran and Gene Vincent on the last tour. Um and Brian Bennett went on to be in a rock and roll band because these guys, obviously, when Elvis came out, you know, and and the early generation, the Brits wanted to imitate that. And they did very, very well. So Cliff Richard, uh, who is still alive today, maybe one of the biggest stars of, of 
uh, English rock starting from the 50s um, mm. uh, was a huge star, but his backing band was called The Shadows. And they were actually a band in their own right who we might compare with the ventures and we you know the ventures walk yes. don't run and a yep. bunch of those tunes which we would say was part of sort of instrumental rock or surf rock yep. um and the shadows were huge in england so whether they played with cliff richards or they had their own career they were just as big as the ventures also you had a really big session scene in the late 50s starting because very much like rock in the united states a lot of the early rock and roll artists really couldn't play. They were just like these skiffle kids. They were just picking up an instrument and trying to play. And so when you try to create a rock and roll industry, you needed season season session players who could just yeah. pump the stuff out. Then you get the kid in who looks cool, who could sing. Sure. So for example, when I interviewed Bobby Morris from Louis Prima's band, um, you know, he was a very trained musician, but he was able to kind of come up with this cool sound that Louis Prima made in the 50s that we might call proto-rock. You know, it was mm -hmm. fast art rhythm and blues shuffles and backbeat with a honking tenor saxophone, all of which are kind of hallmarks of, of rock. And Louis Prima, who actually is from New Orleans, who started out in the big band era, completely reinvented himself as an alternative and in the 50s, he was sort of a weird mashup of like R&B, swing, jazz, New Orleans, but also rock and roll. And he appealed to a younger mm -hmm. audience. So he was part of the early rock scene. Cool. So Bobby Morris, who was his drummer in Las Vegas, who's a trained, you know, bebop jazz guy who, who was playing all the shows in Vegas before he connected with Prima. Now Capitol Records calls him up and says, we got to make all this rock and roll. But we, there's nobody in Los Angeles who can play rock. <laughs> So, can you fly out a couple days a week from Vegas, and you'll go into Capitol, and you'll just record rock wow. tracks all day? They didn't know. They were just like, let's get a drummer who can play rock, which is why, by 1957, Earl Palmer leaves New Orleans and moves mm. to L.A., because, and then proceeds to define rock from there on out, which he'd already done with Little yeah. Richard and Fats Domino in New Orleans, now he goes and, and really gets into the studio. So, you know, these studio guys, another example would be Panama Francis in on yep. the East Coast. And he, I interviewed Panama when he was still alive. I knew Earl very well. I knew Bobby Morris very well. And all these guys just thought of rock as some kind of BS thing. Panama Francis said, that was just choice music. Basically, they just wanted a shuffle with a backbeat, a fast shuffle with a heavy backbeat. And believe it or not, a lot of the, uh, the the session players that were in the studios were either jazzers or they were orchestral players. Sure. And they couldn't play it. They couldn't do it. So, you know, Earl falls into this amazing situation and they're flying Bobby Morris out. And a lot of these records, these guys never got any credit for them, but um, they were, you know, they were important. So in England, you had the same thing. And there was this incredible session scene that that was spawned that included a lot of younger players. So, for example, Hal Blaine, we, his story, he was a young guy. He had known about rock. He had lived rock a little bit. So when he got to L.A., he was able to take advantage of that skill set. Again, that the the lot of the the older players said, "Well, you're going to wreck. You're going to wreck the whole studio scene." And that's why they called themselves the Wrecking Crew because they were younger guys. They didn't <laughs> wear suits and ties. They were yeah rock people. You know, similarly to Carmine Apice in 1974 saying all the rock books are written by guys with, you know, skinny ties and crew cuts and white sh short sleeve shirts, button down shirts. Yeah. I'm a rock star. I play in <laughs> Vanilla Fudge and Cactus. Like, I'm going to write a book called Realistic Rock. Yeah. You know, so this was sort of the takeover of the industry by the next generation. And it certainly happened in England as much as it did here. So Clem Catini played on thousands of records. All of these kinds of stars, uh, Patula Clark and Lulu and um, probably uh, tons of other people that we don't know about, but the young generation of British uh, singers, pop singers, rock singers, um, they, they, you know, Bobby Graham and Clem Catini were kind of the two Hal Blaines of England, you might hmm. say. Interesting. I mean, it's... It's so, I mean, of course, the guys who were doing it then, they didn't grow up on rock and roll, but they'd have to figure it out enough to like, to be cool and to, and, and it's just a different, it's a, 
it's a it's a looseness that might not come naturally to someone who didn't grow up with with that style or if if someone's a absolutely tried and true like like studied drummer you kind of need to like forget everything you've learned we're now doing this where well it's a way of feeling the the beat yeah so it's a way of feeling the groove which i have studied intensively and talk about all the time which is you know making giving it a certain feel um that was that was the way it was done yeah. back then it yeah. became its own style and in this roots of rock drumming book we talk a lot about that and we go through our first interview is bobby morris who really was a jazz and bebop drummer who played yeah. with louis prima and he he was played on a ton of rock records and then the last person we have interviewed is jim keltner who you know came later but was hugely influenced by by these guys and so it's sort of everything in between we have you know southern drummers and blues drummers and you know rock drummers and i mean just the first guys didn't think of themselves as rock drummers they were sort of like well what is rock supposed to sound like you know of course and and then you know later then the next generation did think of themselves as rock drummers and they they had taken what you know the the earlier generation did yeah so anyway it's it's really fascinating and the stories of you know people for example to use a, a common thing about uh people give bernard purdy a lot of grief because of his claims that he played on beatles records and we're not going to go there right now but (laughs) the the issue is that so many of these session musicians and by the way bernard did a million sessions in the early 60s in new york um you would just go in and you'd record all the songs and you wouldn't know who who you were recording for who was the singer you know and so then 20 years later somebody comes up and says oh yeah i love your work on this legendary hit and you're like what they didn't even know that what they were playing on yeah. so that's kind of what bernard's thing is is that he didn't really know who the beatles were they were a british band and you know whether or not it's true i can't sure claim. but the, the way he describes it, it wasn't like you know anyway yeah, yeah. That's i don't want to get into the whole other episode saga, but <laughs> but i mean they're they're they would do and they would do whole albums in a day yeah. i mean it was just yeah. you went in and you hammered it out both in the u.s and in the uk clem Catini talks about that um, they would they would just it was it was brutal i mean hal blaine is sort of the king of that thing by the time hal ascended he was he had three he had a tech first of all and he had three uh drum sets one was always being broken down where he would just finished and the next one was already set up mm. and he would literally go from session to session to session walk in do it because back in those days you didn't have months to do a record you had yeah. a day or two days to do an entire record and that's why they needed you know again this is the beatles are the first band to actually have enough power to say we're not going to tour anymore we sell enough records and we've made you enough money you know capital emi that yeah. that we are going to simply record and you're going to give us 24 hour access to your studios and we're going to make even more money for you <laughs> and just this is going to be our nine to five job go yeah. in and when you when you see the get back movie you know you kind of see how that operates but it was even yep. you know I mean, it's amazing, you know, to watch how they did it. And that was their job. And there's a, I have this wonderful book, um, which, which talks about every single day that the Beatles were in the studio. I know I'm jumping around a lot. But, I No, I have uh, that same book, actually. Just, it's like kind of a wider, yeah, and it's like, white book. Yeah. Yeah. It's yep. like a big coffee table book. It's an incredible book. It's out yep. of, maybe back in print now, but it's sure. like, okay, July 3rd, 1968, they were working on Magical Mystery Tour. Yep. And... This is what they did on July 3rd. You know, they cut vocals and they did this and they did that, you know, from 5 to 8 p.m. or whatever. And um, it's amazing that that's the first time anybody was really a- able to do that, hmm. to have the freedom to do that. The only artist earlier that I can think of, and going back to, to Buddy Holly and Paul McCartney, is that when Buddy Holly made his first series of recordings, his first album, they were sort of partnering with this studio in Clovis, New Mexico. Nobody was, there wasn't, you know, Clovis. It's not even, it's like a tiny little town. Yeah. Buddy yeah. Holly's from Texas, but he's in Clovis, yeah. New Mexico. So they kind of had unlimited time because they were in partnership with the studio owner and they did a lot of incredible studio things, all of which are talked about in this movie, hmm. The Real Buddy Holly Story. Yeah. So I, I, I encourage people to go check that out. Um, 
Anyway, so you have this incredible scene. And also, I should just say, out of this session scene, you had, you know, you, they were younger players. And Clem Cattini talks about drag, you know, setting up the drums, throwing them in his car, driving to other sessions, setting them up, you know, barely having time to eat a sandwich. They mm. weren't paid well. It was not glamorous. Yeah. At the time, rock and roll was not respected. It was seen as just being crappy throwaway kid music that was disposable. And, um, you know, these guys really, uh, you know, were unsung heroes of creating something that would, you know, become bedrock of, of the biggest style that and would change music. Exactly. Um, I was going to say change the world. I mean, that's that's part of the cool thing about rock and roll, though, is like uh, it's it's not supposed to be cool. And I mean, rock rock in, in reality really did kind of like defy it where like, you know, uh, a lot of things, like I said, Disney does disco. OK, disco's dead. But with rock, it seems like it's it's like like a rock where it's it's strong enough to get through all of that. Uh, being like bastardized by certain things where where it really has a raw um i don't know it's raw at its heart where uh you know it's kind of cool that they they were you know fighting their way through and, and not getting paid a lot and just kind of unsung which i have to assume got kind of changed when uh when in the mid er, early mid 60s things changed obviously and it became then very uh very profitable for everyone well i would know? say i would say rock was no different than jazz before it or early rock and roll before it or bebop you know any style that comes up kind of from the streets that is sort of is not accepted by the mainstream is going to have to struggle and if it does break through then yeah. it does become yeah. co-opted and then you have the next style so rock is one of yeah, exactly. many styles that went through that kind of progression uh disco too yeah. i mean disco started as a uh, an expression of of gay new york in 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 you know downtown clubs of manhattan uh was not was not something that was considered respectable um, it was an expression of gay culture. If you think of the village people or, you know, sure. things like that, people were, most people were clueless. They didn't have any idea that the, you know, the guys dressed as the cop and the Indian and the fireman and the, you know, whatever, like, you know, the cowboy It's like, yeah, that didn't register, but that's where it came from, you know? So <laughs> sure. just in the same way that rhythm, rhythm and blues music had these really filthy lyrics, 60 minute man is about a oh, guy yeah. that could, uh, have sex for 60 minutes. He was a stud and, <laughs> uh, but, but the song became a huge hit because nobody, no white people understood what that was, you know? So yeah, and that, these, these things that totally translates up. over into like Led Zeppelin. You think of some of these Zeppelin lyrics, which are, they are may maybe an example of, uh, I mean, literally lifting things from other people and making them their yes. own songs, which that's a whole other conversation. The Lemon Song. Exactly. The Lemon exactly. Song. Like those <laughs> lyrics were copted straight up, and there were a lot of lawsuits about that. And uh, Chuck Berry sued the Beatles over some some lyrics and come together, uh, you know, that were lifted directly from his uh, one of his songs. Mm. So it's another it's another story, but the evolution uh, of these things were, were interesting. And I just want to mention, because I know we're probably getting short on time, but... Sure. Um, some of the figures that came out of this session scene um, would go on to be some of the most important people in the British invasion. So, um, you know, uh, uh, first of all, R Richie Blackmore, uh, the guitarist who would go on to form mm -hmm. Deep Purple, who was an incredible musician. He was uh, one of the regular session musicians in the studio. And I want to talk about studios just yep. for a second. There's the, you know, a lot of the, the, the birth of rock and the magic of rock and really the blues as well what was happening in the 50s was because small studio owners there was no way that certain things certain of these early styles of music were going to cross over to mainstream and they weren't going to have access to the major labels at that time and so yeah. i have a book about rhythm and blues which talks about the evolution of a lot of this music we talked about it the last time i was here on your yep. show yep. um but what what happened is cottage industries developed to satisfy the new audiences that were listening to these styles of music, just like say hip hop in the 1970s. There was no, you know, or rap, n no label was going to look at this and go, Oh yeah. You know, uh, so, yeah. you know, we're going to sign yeah. this. It's never been done before. Uh, and it's so too new. it's, there's no, it, it, it's yeah. too new. It's too scary, too threatening, too weird, too out of the mainstream. Think about when Lady Gaga 
you know, who was also part of the downtown scene and was, you know, uh, just in a totally different world. Who the f is Lady Gaga? I mean, <laughs> you know, probably the first time any one of us heard that name, it was like, Psst, yeah, but what? <laughs> she's Lady Gaga. Now, yeah. she, you know, it's like you people, you get people to to buy into what you're doing and suddenly you're you're the new mainstream. So exactly. Anyway, the. The, for example, Sun Records applied this great kind of slapback reverb that was almost a mistake. And as a result of that, Elvis and Carl Perkins and Johnny Cash and Jerry Lee Lewis had this sound, right? That then everybody wanted because that sound became popular. Chess Records in, in uh, yeah. you know, same thing in Chicago. They applied this sound so that it gave the Muddy Waters and the Little Walters and the Howlin' Wolves this kind of surreal, larger than life, cool sound that was... It was a signature sound. But when those labels were just starting, the salesmen would put the records in the trunks of their car and they would go to, you know, barber shops and hair hair salons. Like that's the way those records were distributed, mm. you know, or they would travel Crazy. to the radio stations and hand them by hand saying, "I, you don't know me, but I have this small station or this small label or this small studio. So there were similar parallels in the UK. And this guy, Joe Meek, M-E-E-K, another really worthwhile, um, if you, especially if you're into kind of crazy 50s rock or garage rock, uh, check him out because he came up with, using, again, funky technology, came up with his own cool sound and the, the bands and the hits that came out of his studio, he did a lot of instrumental rock, shadow style rock, and there's a song called Telstar, which is a, was a huge hit mm. both in the UK and it, it transferred over and became a big hit in the US. Which so it was sort of early, very early British hits breaking into the U.S. scene in the in the very early '60s and very late '50s. We talked a little bit early on on the phone about this, and we mentioned you mentioned Joe Meek, and I said, you know, have you heard of him? And I said, maybe, but I'm pretty sure Meek has uh, M E E K. As a lot of people listening now have home studios, a lot of the presets or plugins you'll see in Waves yes. and all these things. Yes, are there are Meek, whole bundles which, which of are of, of yes. uh, plugins. That's the Joe Meek yes, bundle. Exactly. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, now, like, yeah, you've got the slap back, you know, the guitar sound. I mean, it's it's amazing now how it's all just in, in the box or you buy it as a as a, as a plug-in. Yeah. Yes, you're, you're exactly. absolutely right. And, just you know, a, a lot of yeah. these people didn't make it. I think Joe Meek eventually committed suicide. He wasn't around that long. It was kind of another sad hmm. story of rock and roll wreckage. But what he created was pretty amazing. And I know there's documentaries about him where you could find out. So Richie Blackmore was part of his stable. Um, then, you know, you had Jack Bruce and Jimmy Page who were tremendous. They were just as important as Bobby Graham and uh, and and uh, Clem Cattini. By the way, Clem Cattini was one of the first people they asked to replay to uh join the new yardbirds which would then become led zeppelin sure. and he turned it down because he was too busy in the studios and he didn't want to you know wow. and i i'm not sure if <laughs> maybe it's maybe it was bobby graham that they asked to join led zeppelin uh clem Cattini might have been uh when pete best left the beatles um, they looked at a variety of these studio guys as well so there were you know it wasn't ringo wasn't just a slam dunk i don't yeah think but they yep. it's all in the book they talk about it i know for <laughs> sure clem Cattini got there was interest in him uh joining led zeppelin and he was like why do i want to join some new band when i'm like making regular bucks in the studios you know he's not wrong and, i mean it's the same wrong bet because again we you of don't course. know at that point you don't know what's it was about probably a family explode. man with kids and yep. you know all that kind of stuff so yeah but yep. i think he i think clem is the drummer on telstar i mean a lot of these you know, these drummers played on a lot of this stuff. And so, in any case, uh, Jeff Beck was also on that scene. But, like, you know, uh, just to go back to Jimmy Page and John Paul Jones, I mean, they were monster studio musicians. And yeah. the reason why those Led Zeppelin records are so sound so great is because Jimmy Page had tremendous knowledge already, not only having played on a million hit singles, and he knew how to operate in a studio, unlike so many rock musicians that get in a studio they kind of fall apart or they don't know yeah. how to play to the microphones or you know they're they're just their skills are not good enough yeah yeah and you know john paul jones as well so the fact that you know perhaps the biggest band out of that whole thing i mean you know who's bigger really doesn't matter but certainly led zeppelin is maybe considered the greatest rock and roll sure. band of all time by sure. many um they didn't they got their start 
you know, in this world in the late 50s and really in the early 60s yeah. uh, of, 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 the, of that kind of a thing. Which, I mean, so, even that lends itself to the kind of the whole thing and, and that I think it's almost a, a debunking of this is this British invasion. It's almost like, like I almost had maybe in the back of my mind, like you just, you kind of think it's an overnight thing or it's, it just happens or the plane lands, Beatles get off wave, boom, the world changes or the who right. or whatever. And these bands just kind of happen. But no, I mean, like you said, they're, they're experienced um, studio musicians. They're practiced. They sound great for a reason. I mean, they're they're phenomenal musicians. Um, which that I mean, it has to once it once it hits and the British invasion happens, which is kind of where uh, like our conversation is basically leading up to that point. And then that's because again, this is the the roots of it. It's the origins of it. It's not now. Let's get into the rest of that. Which maybe that's another episode in, it, in entirely. I'm sure it is. But um, it's 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 a long road, and I really like knowing the origins of it. About a lot of stuff comes back from World War II, man. I mean, technology, music. It just it changed the world in so many ways by nature of uh, just necessity. By things had to change. You're starting over. Well, not only that. I mean, one other thing that blows my mind. It's just a factoid about World War II is that Americans traveled all over the world during that war and were exposed to a lot of different cultures. Yeah. And what they brought back and how that affected the music or what kind of music people were suddenly open to hearing was was another huge factor that opened a lot of a lot of musical doors in a lot yeah. of ways. Um, the fact that Americans, you know, who I mean, first of all, people didn't travel. Travel was not as easy as it is today. No. It was you had to ha- either have money or have a reason to travel. Most people never went far from home. Suddenly you have millions of of Americans traveling overseas to very exotic places. Yeah. I mean, not only Europe, but like, you know, the the uh, the Pacific, the South Pacific yeah, and exactly. Japan and yeah. places like that, which were yeah. may as well have been just another planet, you know, at that time. And they're time. young American boys. These are not like, you know, grown 50-year-old men. These are like probably somewhat raunchy young American boys coming over and just like ready to almost, you know, they're they're – I might die tomorrow. Well, so it's yeah. like let's <laughs> let's party. <laughs> Which yeah, is let's just experience. Fe- let's let's yeah. experience. You know, let's have some experience. So yeah, I mean, I think really just to summarize it all, like it, it's it's not just one thing. Nothing is just one thing. It's so many different little elements, and I really do like the back and forth of how America influenced the British, you know, musicians, and then it's how the British influenced the american musicians it just is this back and forth of like absolutely like a ping pong game and, of like, and to this day yeah. you know I, I guess maybe one of my big points that i want to make here is that we we all think of that the brits were initially it, that it is a back and forth you know maybe people think well the brits just came up with all that on their own well no they were very influenced by american music mm-hmm. uh but then you know what they brought to the table really there is a very strong to this day uh element of british rock that continues and and continues to produce its own great artists so there was a distinct rock culture in england uh in particular there probably were in other countries too i just don't know much about that but certainly you know what what britain has produced and continues to produce uh it continues to be just as groundbreaking and awesome and amazing um, yeah. in it, in its own culture. And, uh, you know, over there, of course, you have the influence of Jamaicans, which was also happening in starting in the sixties. Uh, sure. and you have the whole, you know, reggae thing and, and ska and rock steady and punk, you know, punk thing that emerged. And so it, yeah. it, it goes on and on. Awesome. Well, I think this is a great conversation again, covering the roots of the British invasion, because again, at the point where we stop is like where the entire explosion happens. And then you get into all of the like Keith moons and the Ringo's and the Charlie Watts and all that stuff, which we all know a lot about. There'll be another episode down the road about that. But, uh, for now, Mr. Glass, I would like to talk about your latest album, um, just to kind of help promote that a little bit, because you share all this great knowledge with everyone, but on top of just being a really, truly a wealth of, uh, of information and just, uh, I mean, I feel like I could stop you on the street and say, Daniel, when did this happen? And then you just say, <laughs> you'd give me an entire I would, 20 minutes later. I would finish my answer. <laughs> yeah. No, but I feel like you really do. You, you, you absorb it all and you, you know, all this stuff. But anyway, you just recently released, uh, with the Daniel glass trio, bam, your great new album, which I've thoroughly enjoyed. 
Uh, just tell everyone about it and tell them where they can find it and listen. It's 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 everywhere. But tell us about it. Uh, well, I'm uh, people maybe who have followed me know that um, I moved to New York about 12 years ago uh, in 2010. And prior to that, I, I was in Los Angeles for about 20 years. So I sort of had two major chapters of my musical life, uh, at least in terms of where I was located and what was going on. And um, I did a fair amount of, I mean, I had my own band, Royal Crown Review, that I yes. was very involved in the business uh, of running that band when that was happening. Um, and I also led of uh, several different projects, jazz-based projects uh, in in LA when I was living there. Um, and I, when I moved to New York, my focus had already shifted and was shifting to me really developing what I do as an educator and a historian. So yeah. the books and the DVDs and also my private teaching practice and the clinics that I do. Um, and I sort of said to myself, I'm going to put down band leading for a while because it is difficult to say the least. You know, all the responsibility <laughs> is on you. Trying to sell the thing is on you. Uh, you got to just do all the hustling. And I said, I'm just as a musician, I'm going to be a side man. So flash forward 10 years. Um, actually, flash forward to 2016. I started a... Uh, a jazz intensive that I did in New York for for four years, and now I should mention I'm doing. I did it in Germany last year, uh, and we're doing it again in October of this year, October of 2022. Um, cool. And it's it's cool because I lived in New York, and I was like, I want to have people come from all over the country, all over the world, and study jazz in depth in New York. And one of the elements of the jazz intensive, which is like four days and five nights and people would go to concerts and all kinds of stuff and just be immersed in the jazz energy of the city. One of the, um, the elements of that intensive was I put together a house trio. So the house trio would do a concert on the opening night and then, uh, people would be able to sit in with them every day and get critiqued both by myself and the band. And that was cool. one of the biggest things about the jazz intensive that um, made it successful. You know, people got the chance to play with high level New York musicians. Yeah. So the two guys that I chose a wonderful guitar player named Sean Harkness and great bass player named Michael O'Brien. Um, I chose them because I thought they'd be pretty open. First, they were amazing musicians. Of course, New York is full of yeah. them. It's rotten yep. with them. But <laughs> then we, I figured they would be good at educating uh, just from their personalities and they were patient and they were articulate yeah. and whatever. Yeah. So I ended up then hiring these guys, not only for the jazz intensives, but whenever I got a call for a little corporate gig or, you know, private event or whatever, uh, I would always call them. And we start, we realized that we had this insanely great rapport. We would, every night at the jazz intensive, the opening concert was just uh, us playing, you know, to sort of set set the stage and um, and show what a New York band is all about. Yeah. And with no effort, these guys, you know, the three of us just fell together and we would have the best time and we would go off on all kinds of tangents and directions with no rehearsal. We just, it's like, and just threw repertoire together. What do you got? What do you got in original, this, that? And after a while, I was like, maybe we should do something with this because this is pretty special. So flash forward now to 2020. No, we haven't done anything because our schedules are so crazy. You know, we're all working and doing a million things. Now we're in a pandemic. And I, during 2020, I took my jazz intensive. I did an online jazz intensive and mm. people did it online, but we sure. still did a concert. And I was like, if we're going to go into a studio and set up mics and everything and do a concert, let's record an album. So we recorded an album. Now, that's, this is August of 2020, almost two years ago. I had no idea what I was going to do with this. I didn't know what was going to happen. But I just sort of had it in my back pocket. And um, flash forward again now, another year plus later to December of 2021. And I'm playing at Birdland. I play a lot at Birdland. People know I have a regular Monday gig there for almost the whole time I've been in New York. And yeah. I work with a lot of different artists. Um a label from Nashville was coming up and was recording artists kind of on the cabaret Broadway type scene that I was working in. And I ended up playing on three of the records that they recorded. So December of last year, I'd gotten to know them. I went to them and I said, 
hey, um, I have this jazz record. I'm just sitting on it. And do you know of any labels that might want to put out a jazz record? You know, not even thinking that would be something that they would do because every mm. record I did with them was a vocal record. As, mm. You know, yeah. And it was more a great American songbook, that kind of stuff. I said, it's kind of more modern. There's a lot of originals. So they, <laughs> they said, well, actually, part of our mission is we want to put out instrumental jazz as well as as the vocal stuff so i'd love to listen to it so they listened to it they loved it and suddenly we're signing with them and bam, things are happening bam <laughs> it's happening and we we had a uh already right around that time had a release had a, a gig set up at birdland the owner let us do a gig so that became our cd release event and now we had this deadline we had to work towards getting the record together the great thing about them was that they had a major label digital distribution nobody really has physical distribution unless you're taylor swift yeah. you know you don't nobody carries cds but yeah, yeah digital distribution it's a whole new world with spotify and pandora and you know using facebook sure. and youtube and it's it's a big deal so having a uh, digital distribution with virgin which is who does ours uh which is a major um, yeah. is great because it opens up certain doors and changes the algorithms so you're heard by a lot more people, at least. Yeah. Or they're promoting it actively within Spotify or within these platforms. Yeah. So anyway, uh, that's that's how we got to it. And I, I feel like I'm sort of torn in so many directions as a drummer. I'm not a foremost jazz drummer. I am very into jazz. I'm a good jazz drummer. You're but right. I do a lot <laughs> of other things uh, and one of the cool things about this group of guys is that we're we're not felt like we're limited. I think one of the great things about being in the 21st century and being in the world of jazz is that you can kind of do whatever the hell you want. Yeah. And it can kind of be called jazz as long as there's sort of improvisation happening and uh, soloing and that kind of interaction. Uh, yes. Anything is fair game. And kind of if you think about like Mark Juliana and Robert Glasper, who I just saw in a free concert two nights ago, mind blowing. Chris Dave was playing drums. Hmm. Um, it's fun. That's a funk gig, but yet they're improvising and just doing the most amazing kind of stuff. And there's a lot of listening and interacting. So yeah, it's jazz, you know, sure. great. Of course there, there's no spang spang a lang going on and there's no, <laughs> there's no standards, but he took, he, he covered some tunes, you know, he did smells yeah. like teen spirit and everybody wants to rule the world tunes that I didn't, think i'd be hearing from robert glasper but anyway wow cool. but but like pieces of them not even you know not like a direct cover sure. so yeah. one of the things that we had jammed on at one of these little private parties with this trio was smoke on the water as a joke right smoke on the water is one of those tunes that it's like a caricature of itself it's like free yeah. bird or yeah stairway to yeah. heaven you know where it's just like it's like more cowbell you know it's just it's just become like something that's so uh, 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 you know yeah, it's like, it's a like joke. the first song you learn almost exactly the first song you yeah. learn and then immediately you're way too cool to ever play it again exactly you know exactly. and yeah deep purple still does it because it's their song so good on yeah. them but like you know anyway we came up with this version of smoke on the water that is it's just our own thing and it's yeah. almost has so little to do with the original smoke on the water other than it's yeah. the same chords and melody but it's really it alludes to it it alludes but it's to it. not yeah, exactly. and I so you know, and we actually added. Speaking of British Invasion, um, Cream, you know the Eric Clapton, Jack Bruce, mm -hmm. Ginger Baker. Uh, we added a Cream song. It's not on the album, but it's going to be on the next album, and it's our oh, cool. it was our show opener, and uh, it's the tune "I Feel Free," and yeah. it's again totally taken into its own direction, which is very exciting. Uh, but that's you know the band this this album just it's it's more about the vibe of the band and our i like to say it's like three kids in a sandbox and so because of the eclectic nature of the band and the eclectic nature i wanted it to be different than just another jazz album and so when we went in to shoot the cover i said well let's just set up a white background like most of you think jazz covers they're dark in a dark club and there's some yeah, serious guy wall. with glasses on you know smoking or like just looking so cool yeah and we're like what if we totally did the opposite and i just started goofing i picked up a pair of sticks and the snare drum and just started doing crazy weird things yeah. and going into weird positions with this white background and i had the other two guys do that and when we looked at all the footage or the photos there's this picture of me just kicking straight out to the camera and yep. it's such a cool shot. It's very 3D. I was going to say, it's 3D. It, it it like 
it's 3D, but not obviously, but it gives you it's a sense of uh, of depth to yeah. it. Yeah, and and the word Bam just came to me, and I you know because my nickname in Royal Crown Review was Bam Bam, and Bam is a percussive sound, yes. and I feel like that picture of me kicking is just like here we are, Bam, you know, like bam. here's this record, Bam, and <laughs> I looked at a lot of old covers for inspiration going back to the fifth, a lot of those very cool jazz covers from the fifties. There was all kinds of amazing and sixties, and I just decided like the three of us kind of each picture was taken separately but but sort of put together as a as a montage with the word yep. bam which takes up about half the size of the cover <laughs> you can't miss it you know yeah. with an exclamation yeah. point the album is yeah, bam like, exclamation what's point. the title again oh yeah it's bam. so <laughs> you know i i thought either this is going to like charm people and people are going to love this or it's going to be a embarrassment and die a horrible death thankfully i was my hunch was right yeah and you know we're up and running and i think it's it's crazy i'm back on the band lady thing i sunk a lot of money into this record it's my record you know even though it's a trio but of course but at the same time like i'm the way i'm going to work it is we're hopefully going to do in addition to playing gigs we're going to do clinic-y things together and educational things together that we've been doing already and that's going to get us to wherever and then we'll do our concerts and you know you have to kind of these days if you have a jazz group you got to figure out some way to finance the thing. And so we'll yeah, see I mean, what and happens. That's, but. that's who you are, is the clinician and the teacher. I yeah. mean, that's th- there's no point. It's silly to separate the two because really that's, I mean, that's what you're great at. I mean, I think it, it it's just a part of you. So it's it's great to, yeah. to put them together. And, and people, like I said- People who know me as a drummer who plays historical styles are going to be very surprised when they hear this record because it's very modern. And yeah. I, you know, I- I am an eclectic person and that's why I can't just be satisfied with like, well, I'm going to study, you know, rhythm and blues of the forties and fifties. No, I've got to go from ragtime all the way up to today and <laughs> yeah. try to become an expert in all those styles. But part of me has always loved very modern and contemporary jazz. And I want to do something artistic that tries to break some barriers in my own way and do yeah. some, some things that, you know, are new and yeah. so I'm trying to go out and see the Robert Glaspers and the Mark Julianas. I'm trying to listen to pop music and, you know, just draw from, I mean, that's the beauty. We have all this freedom today to really draw from a lot of stuff and to kind of repackage it into our own image, so to speak, our own vibe. And one of the yeah. nicest compliments I got, uh, I did uh, a, a thing with um, Sean Kennedy, who's a percussionist. He's more, uh, he plays drum set great, but he's also a legit classical percussionist in dc and he has a podcast and we were talking and he said what i would say about this album daniel is that it is a representation of you like all of it is just you to the max yeah. and i thought that's awesome i'll take that yeah. you know yeah like yeah it's taking all the bits of history that you've learned throughout your entire career and just kind of but you're also like a cool guy and you you it comes out in a i mean not everything you do is uh academia it's 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 boiled down to like all right now this is what actually comes out as you being the just the 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 person as opposed to the historian so i think it's great i've listened to it mainly in my kitchen just kind of doing stuff around the kitchen and it because again with a kid and a baby i'm just like it's just good and everyone likes it i feel like it's very listenable um it's just awesome and i i I can't recommend it enough so what i will do is put in uh in the description uh the link for the album at daniel's website um, a link to the books, including the uh, uh, basically a couple of the books you've done that we've we've talked about in the past, but um, obviously the roots of rock drumming, which I highly recommend. Um, the commandments so book, which uh, the command, yeah, exactly. Yep, I'll put everything in there, and everyone can find it. And your your website has everything as well. But um, yeah. yeah, Daniel, um, I just can't thank you enough for coming back on. You're someone who I've always really, before I started doing this on my own, I really looked up to and was watching your, uh, you know, Century Project video, which again, I'll put in the description because that's a huge influence. Um, on that note, Daniel, thank you for being here, my friend. Thank you, Bart. And you're doing great work, man. And I, I'm always about keeping our instrument, the history, the evolution, our heritage and our traditions alive and informing people because, you know, if you're not going to make good music tomorrow if you don't know where you come from. There's just all there is to it. And it's so inspiring as well. In today's world where people are so easily dismayed and depressed and isolated and lonely, there's this whole incredible world out there, which is our history. And we it's still alive. It's living. And we can yeah. tap into it and be inspired by it. So 
yeah thanks you know thanks for 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 you sharing it 